It's good to see you this morning. Glad all of you are here. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll listen to this message to the very end. Some days the Lord will instruct me to just give you the case for what God has said in His Word. Today is one of those days. We're going to be talking to you about the holiness of Christian living. And without holiness, no man shall see God. But most people don't have a clue what that means. And I'm going to give you the case for what that means today. Amen. I want you to know, I don't want you to get uh, distracted in your mind. Don't let Satan keep you from getting what God wants you to have. Because if you don't have an understanding of these things in the Word, then how are you going to be what He has for you? And you will miss eternal life if you don't have that Word. That Word has His anointed on, on it to break the yoke of every bondage off of you. It's not my opinion of the Word. It's not even my explanations of the Word. It is the Word of God that has the anointing on it. And so that Word is what I'm going to give you today as we talk about holiness and the holiness of Christian living. So, all right. Our proof text today is going to come from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 that it says, follow peace with all men. Now I want you to understand this is a two-part verse. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now we're going to talk about that in ways that needs to be talked about and show you the things that the Bible says. It's not your opinion it's the Word of God that sets what holiness is and how it's going to be established. Our objectives today is a biblical contrast. We're going to look at both sides of, a, of the same coin. You understand that everything in God's Word has with it, most everything in God's Word has with it an if or a but. And you have to hear these ifs because those ifs are actually highlighting what the Holy Spirit is trying to get you to have. So we're going to look at this in biblical contrast. We're going to reveal what holiness is scripturally. And I want you to realize that we have to go through the scripture to make you see those things. If we don't, you will. I will have to answer for you if I don't do this. You understand when He called me, He called me according to His purpose not mine, not yours. And when He called me, He said that you put before them my word, the case for my word. Well, that's what we're going to do today. Show how one can become holy. How many of you want to be holy? How many of you want to see the Lord? Those of you that didn't raise your hand, you need to go back and raise your hand because if you don't have holiness, you will not see the Lord. That's, that's His word on the matter. So listen to these things we're saying and understand the benefits of holy living. So we're going to go through these. There's about five things we're going to go through and I'll try to go through them. I'm not going to go through them speedily. I'm just going to read the Word to you, okay? Just what is holiness? What does it mean to be holy? Do you know? Well, I hope you do. But if you don't, today is a good, a good a time as any uh, to hear what the Word says about holiness. Okay, First thing we're going to do is we're going to attempt to let the Scripture give us a definition and measured requirements for holiness. They're measured requirements. In other words, He's put forth what you have to do to be a holy person. Are you ready for that? Because it's going to mean change for you. It means that you have to comply with God to have what God says you can have. And if you're not holy, you were not going to be ready when He comes. Amen? Amen? So, our focus here is first to reveal 
holiness. And I want you to know scripturally what holiness is. It means in this first verse, to establish. It's not a word we use in the American language. We usually say establish. But it means to prove, to investigate, and to prove. So that's what we're doing right now, okay? In 1 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, To the end He may establish your hearts. Now what is He going to do? He's going to investigate your heart, and He's going to prove your heart. You can't do that. You don't know how to. The Holy Spirit has to shine a light on the evil that still exists inside the man. Do you understand that? He'll show you what your thoughts, He knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. And He has to do that. And when He's doing that, He's not trying to condemn you. Understand, He's trying to train you in righteousness. And He's leading you toward holiness every time. I understand there are people that today look at things, if you say something out of the Word of God, they'll think you're trying to condemn them. Darling, that is not what the Word of God is for. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus that live according to the Spirit and don't fulfill the deeds of the flesh. There are two messages in that same verse. You understand there's two sides to that coin. Those that know Him and those that don't. And so you've got to know which side of the coin you're on. Amen. Amen. So, <laughs> we'll go on. He wants to establish your hearts. Make them unblameable in holiness without blame. That means He has to deal with the things inside of you as a human that could make you blameable and unholy. So, then He goes on, in all holiness before God, even the Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We've talked about this one for three weeks now. I hope you're listening. Be not conformed to this world. We talked about what conformity was. It's giving place to the world, having the world's mindset, and listening to the world, and letting the world come out of your mouth. You're not guilty until your mouth opens, even from a God's standpoint, but He's going to judge every word that you say. Amen? So we need to stay on God's side. And I listen to your conversations and the people around me all the time. And I want you to know there's a, there's a reason for this message. Your conversations sometimes go off track. I hear things that come out of your mouth that should never come out of your mouths. Understand, if I don't speak up and say something about it, the blood's on me. But if I say, you've got to watch your mouth. But before you watch your mouth, you've got to watch what you let into your heart. Because of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That abundance of your heart comes out of your mouth. So when I hear worldliness coming out of you, there's a warning coming. It is my place to stand before you and tell you that you've got to watch your words. God's listening to everything you say. And He's got a record running record of your mouth, your events. Amen? Amen? Foolishness comes out of mouths. Well, that's children, right? They don't know any better. But the reason they don't know any better is because they don't have adults that know better. If they hear it from an adult, it'll come out of their mouths too. Is that true? Children are a script unwritten until they're around someone else. And then that script is written on them. So, and they have a hard time because some of you don't have any control over this, this thing called the mouth. And the heart shows what's in, in you. Okay? Now, don't get upset yet. I hadn't got to the place that you need to get upset. <laughs> <laughs> Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, comma, American, comma. Transformed means put the Word of God in you. 
how often do you need to put the Word of God in you? Every single day. You need to be reading the Word of God if you don't cut on a television or pick up an iPhone or an iPad. You need to be in the Word of God on a daily basis, especially knowing that Jesus is coming back for those that have been transformed by the renewing of their mind. And I'm going to show you the importance of that. Renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you don't know the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, your mind's going, well, I think, I think, and listen, he said, you don't lean on your understanding. In all your ways, you acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. You can't allow your mind to go astray. You go, go in a workplace, and I know you know, we're in the world, but not of it, and we're not supposed to be of it. We're supposed to be different than the world. And if you, you find yourself slipping up and you're thinking things and you're speaking things that are not in line with what the Word of God says, you need to repent. Repent means what? Change your mind. Change your heart. Get yourself cleaned up so that you don't have to worry about where you're going to stand when Jesus Christ shows up. I'm going to show you some things today that will mess with some of your doctrines. But you understand, from a biblical standpoint, your doctrines need to change according to His Word. Amen. It's not you making doctrines so that everybody's going to agree with you. It is the Word of God you need agreement with because the Word of God is forever and it will judge all souls. Amen? Amen. So, don't get upset yet. Anyway, 1 Thessalonians 4.7 says this, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but holiness. What are you watching on television? What are you listening to in conversation? Who are you hanging with? I want to tell you, he said, come out of the world. Do you get this? Don't hang with the world. If you don't want to be with, like the world, you can go out to the world, but you've got to be a witness and a light in the world. You can't be like them and be a witness. Amen? Amen. And I'm not trying to get on to you. I'm just talking about what's going to take to get you in line with Jesus Christ before He comes. Amen? All right. And in this next verse, the word for us is going to be yield. I want you to look for that word, okay? It says here, But God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed the word from the heart, uh, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. And I speak after the man, this was Paul speaking, after the manner of men because of your, the infirmity of your flesh. Infirmity of the flesh. Weakness, if you don't know that word. How many of you have got a weak flesh? That's 100%. The rest of you are liars. Okay, so anyway. And then you, you, see your, you see your weakness right there. Because if you can't admit that you have a problem and a battle every day with your flesh, do you understand? You do. But you have to bring that into subjection to the Word of God. Amen? So I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, that's the twisting of the word, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Righteousness and holiness are mentioned together over and over again. Right standing is the word, uh, the meaning of the word righteousness. And we're, we're going to show you holiness, okay? For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. All of you that have a, a definition of salvation that includes that you can do anything that you want to do and sin is all right, you have no clue what you're saying. And I don't care what church you go to, if it's not based on this Word of God, that's out of line with God. Amen? He will judge you too. So I want you to understand, God is looking at the heart of a man. He listened to everything that comes out of your mouth. He's making a record, and you will stand before Him eyeball to eyeball and give an, uh, an account for whatever thing you have said. Amen? Amen? How careful must we be with our words? 
even with our thoughts. And if you're surrounded with sin and you keep surrounding yourself with sin, out of your mouth is going to come sin. And by the way, have you noticed that the world is an angry place these days? And he starts off this with, be at peace with all men. And then that goes deeper, and I'll get into that in just a second. Okay? So anyway, <laughs> you have now become servants of righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? How many of you are ashamed of the things you used to do? If you're not... Uh, you don't probably have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know now that you wouldn't go back and do those things again if you ever had to. You wouldn't do that. If you belong to Christ. If you're still in sin, you're free from righteousness. Did I just read that from this Scripture? And you had no fruit in Christ. We can go into John 15 and we can talk about Tree limbs that don't bear fruit. What happens to them? They're cut off and they're cast into the fire. Understand, this is something that's fearful. Because He's looking at every one of us and the only way to have the fruit of God is to live in righteousness and true holiness. And a lot of people say they're holy because they got holiness on the outside of their church. But that doesn't make them holy. As my daddy used to say, just because a cat has kittens in an oven, don't make them biscuits. <laughs> Amen. So having said that to you, uh, let's go on. What fruit had you in those things whereof you're now ashamed for the end of those things is death. What is the Lord saying here? If you continue in sin, the end of it is death. He's not talking about physical death. All men will die. And after that's the judgment. But he's talking about the second death. You will not be going to heaven if you continue in sin. You have put away from yourself the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to live in righteousness and you don't want true holiness. And you will not be with Him when He comes. No corrupt thing will go into the kingdom of God. No corrupt thing. So you have to live for Him. You have to make your mind up that you're going to live for Him and live in righteousness and true holiness. So, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, what is a servant? A slave. To God, you have your fruit, in, uh, fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. He contrasts these things one against the other so that you can plainly see the doctrines of men are sometimes doctrines of demons because they allow people to think that you don't have to do anything. Jesus paid it all, right? But your belief in Jesus is supposed to bring you into a place of having the Holy Spirit and doing as Jesus did. Amen. Jesus uh, actually was our example with the last verse I read to you was out of John last week. He said that I came as an example unto you. Live as I lived. Understand, He's telling you what He expects and He's the one that will judge you. Okay? Are you all still with me? Okay. So, at the end is everlasting life. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ. There is no way, other way all of you that have a different doctrine, a different, a different definition of religion, there is no other way to God the Father except through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Romans chapter 6, verse 22 says this, Being now uh, made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Over and over he says this again. This is a case for him that says to you that you have to go into heaven through him, by him, and the way he did. He is the what? The way, the truth, and the life. He starts off with way. 
What He did, you must do. That means put yourself in the presence of the Almighty God on a daily basis. Read His Word. Get it established in your heart. And then change what you think about on a regular basis. If something goes into your mind and it's not from His Word, you need to be correcting that at the moment that, that it happens and not let it come out of your mouth. Don't laugh about things that are unholy. Don't give yourself to unholy thinking. Well, that sounds a lot too difficult for me. Darling, the difficulty is in your flesh. It's an unborn spirit that needs to be born again. And when it's born again, it's not as tough as you think it is. You hate the things that you used to be, and you don't want to do the things you used to do. And that's the way that it's supposed to be to the very end. Amen? Amen. All the people that go into church today say, well, I'm all right. Because Jesus died and I believe that He, he died. Listen, the demons believe and tremble. That doesn't make them righteous and it doesn't make them holy and they will not be going to heaven. They were thrown out for the very reason, for the very reason that they thought, well, I've already got it made in the shade. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, find you some shade now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Cleanse and change. Second Corinthians chapter seven verse one says this: Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. What does that mean? Deal with the problems that you have as a person. Don't let your problem be somebody else's problem. Amen. So. Uh, Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. By the way, that filth can get into your spirit. Did you see that there? It's not just in your flesh, it's in your spirit too. Because when you allow a little of it in, Satan doesn't have a little bit. When you say, you hear him saying it's all right, you know, everybody else laughs at that. Everybody else enjoys that. Listen, it doesn't matter about everybody else because I'm going to stand before my God, my Creator, and my, my Savior, and I have to give an account. What did I allow and what did I disallow? And He's telling us what to disallow. Filthiness, uncleanness of the flesh and the spirit has to be cleansed. He says, cleanse. Whose, whose responsibility this is this? It's yours. He says, cleanse yourselves. Say, ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So you have to perfect holiness. That means you can't continue to do the things you used to do. You can't continue with the people you used to hang with. You can't continue in some sort of unrighteous behavior and think that God is going to smile upon you. That's corruption. That is twisting. That's iniquity. That's twisting the Word of God. It is not leaning on the Word of God for your salvation. And salvation is none other than the Word of God and the Word was in John, His Son. Do you understand? He's the Word. And He became flesh. Alright? Understand. So, <laughs> let's, let me go on. I can, I can really get into this stuff right here, but I, I need to go on. <laughs> All right. 1 Peter 22 and 23. Well, let's go back. Okay. If so be that you have heard of Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. It's a case. This is a legal case 
Change your doctrines. Get in line with the Word of God. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, seeing that you have purified your souls. Who? Purified your soul? You. you. And obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Now you hate me because I represent Him. Do you understand that? If your flesh hates me, I understand that. If you would hear Jesus, you would hear me. He called me for His purpose. And so, by having saying, saying that to you, seeing that you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart. What's a pure heart? Fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. My case is the word is Jesus, and Jesus' spirit comes to abide in you, and he's supposed to be leading you into paths of righteousness in all truth, all along your way. See, he's going to do that. But you have to give him uh, that body of flesh that you got, that mind and that spirit so that He can do His work to make you like Him. Amen? Amen. He does the making, but you have to obey Him. Well, I don't like all the things the Word says. Get in line. <laughs> Anybody in the flesh is not going to like it. For heaven's sake, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you my testimony is that I've been hated by thousands of people because I stand for the truth and won't stand for a lie. The spirit of Satan is a liar. And when you listen to him, it's, he will speak to your deceitful lust. And when you give in to him, your fruit is in unrighteousness and not holiness. Not righteousness. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 says, To the end He may establish your heart, there it is again, uh, unblameable in holiness before God, even the Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Now what is He saying to you? He's going to establish you, but you have to obey Him. You have to love His Word, stay in His Word, allow His Word to change who you are, and make you a child of God. The Word of God will change you. You won't get away with the things you're doing. And I promise you, if you get in the Word, you're going to be convicted. What's a convict? <laughs> Conviction is where God makes you guilty. And then you have to beg, beg Him for forgiveness because you're guilty. Guilty of what? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. But it's that very blood you need. Because without it, there's no remission of sins. Amen? So listen. Then we get down to our behaviors. We're on point two. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to the end, listen. And oh, I'm sorry. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness. Say that. God hath not called me unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. So if you've got a call on your life, there's a reason why many are called, but only a few are chosen. Do you understand? The choosing of God is looking at the, sin the sincerity of your heart. I know. I have people all the time saying, Brother Ron, you're too tough. I'm not tough enough, darling. I'm trying to save your soul from hell through the Word of God which cannot be changed and the witness of the Holy Spirit that will never change. Amen. Titus. Oh, wait a minute. First Timothy. 
I'm going to talk to women just a minute. You know, the Bible says things and women kind of center on them and they get upset with Paul. Do you understand that Paul spoke by the Spirit? So if you're upset with him, he's not talking about sexuality here. And you know, we've got this generation that thinks it's all about you know, the biases of race and color and, 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 and sexuality. But listen, he says here, in 1 Timothy 2.15, he says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. Now, do you know why a woman will have to be saved in childbearing? But because before she bears a child, she's all about her vanity. And the Word of God says that too over in the Song of Solomon. It talks about it being a questionable gift. That a woman is a beautiful thing. And they're soft. They smell good most of the time. <laughs> but it says that she's going to be saved in childbearing. If they continue, did you hear an if in there? Now pay attention. If they continue in faith and charity, that means love, and holiness with sobriety. So there's an if there. That childbearing can save you. It means that you're going to be, you, you've become unselfish. You're not looking in the mirror and like the one pastor said, you know, he preached on pride one Sunday and a, a woman came to him and she said, I want to confess a sin to you, pastor. Well, what's that sin, sister? Well, it's pride. I was sitting looking in the mirror and thinking how beautiful I am. And he looked at her and he said, Sister, that's not the sin of pride. <laughs> there's, a, there's another part of that. I'm, I'm going to get on troubled soul with my wife now. <laughs> uh, that's hopefulness. <laughs> Uh, deception, actually. Anyway, let's go on. Because he was talking to aged women here. <laughs> Titus 2, 3 through 8, it says, The aged women, uh, likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers. Don't lie on people. Don't gossip out about people. And I know how bad it is because Satan looks at women because he got to the man through the woman in the garden. She was not listening to God. She was listening to her husband, but Adam had to answer. Do you understand that? So, the aged women likewise has had that they be in behavior as becoming holy, uh, holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. Understand that. Don't, don't get drunk. Uh, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, First thing, to love their husbands. Second thing, to love their children. Third thing, and to be discreet. What does that mean? Don't go telling everybody what you've heard. Have you noticed that women talk more than men do? And if you're not chaste in your speech, and you're not discreet, People will look at you as a gossip. They'll look at you. They will characterize you by what you say and what's coming out of you. Be discreet. Chaste. That means pure. Not given to everybody that comes around. We've got a generation that thinks you can go to bed with anybody you want to and then somebody's got to Repent, right? Listen, you need to know the Word of God. Chaste, keepers at home, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the Word of God be not blasphemed. 
if you can't submit to your own husband, you're blaspheming the Word of God. Because he is, according to the Word of God, the head, the legal federal head of the home. And if he's leading you in the right path, then you're not obeying him, then you blaspheme the Word of God. It has been done a lot. Then he gets on young men. <sighs> Likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. Gravity, that means, again, security. Sincerity and sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part might be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Your mouth gets you in trouble, doesn't it? People look at you and think you have no control. And that's more often the truth than not. So our course of correction, and we're going to look at that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 through 11, it says, If you endure chastening. How many of you have ever been to the woodshed? <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Probably not. Ever got a spanking? I know you have. <laughs> I didn't do it like my, my father did. He said, I'm going to tear you a new one. I didn't know what that meant, but I experienced it a couple of times. <laughs> More than a couple of times. I don't want to lie in the pulpit. <laughs> There's a lot, lot of times that I went to the woodshed. <laughs> but anyway, endure chastening. You have to endure chastening. What does that mean? Well, you, you go to church and you go home and I'm not happy about that sermon today. It made me feel uncomfortable. It's chastening of the Lord. It's instruction in righteousness. It's calling you to holiness. Happy is not, by the way. That's one of the things they say in psychology. The goal of psychology is to get you happy, right? Listen. When you got the Lord on your side, you can be as happy as you want to be. You'll have the joy of the Lord in your heart. It doesn't mean that you're going to be happy about everything that goes in the world. We're in a world that's filled with tribulation. We don't have to be happy about that. I didn't. I wasn't happy about everything that went on in Washington the last two years or four years. But I want to tell you something. Washington's not my Savior. Amen. Jesus Christ is my Savior. And he has a different way about him. So I had to come out of that stuff. Did you have to cut it? Anybody beside me had to cut the news off this year? <laughs> Satan speaks. He's, he's the prince and power there. And he's got these demonas that come on CBS, ABC, NBC, and some of them on Fox. And they'll sit there. They put the pretty ones out there and, and make you listen to them. It's a woman's spirit that Satan is using in the world to try to manipulate the world into a place. I can show that to you in Revelation. That's another day. Anyway, he goes on. He says, Furthermore, we had fathers that were in the flesh. Oh, well, let me go back. Yeah, just for the children. I'll be kind here. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. That means a fatherless child. Somebody that doesn't have correction, direction, a federal head over them that's leading them in a path of righteousness. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after our own pleasures, but He for our profit that we might be partakers of His holiness. Why do you get corrected? Holiness. Exactly right. Without that, you'll not see Him. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but <coughs> grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. 
I never liked any spanking I ever got. Still get a few. They, they come from a higher power. But when He deals with those things, He is changing me from the inside out. And I don't give Him, you know, praise you on that day. I'm going, I needed that. <laughs> you don't like it when He exposes you. But He's exposing something that can steal, kill, and destroy. It's taking away the holiness that you need to be a son or a daughter of God. So, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless. Afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that's exercised thereby. So we're going into the fourth one now and we're in the closing season. I know you're glad. The how-to's. Fixing our attention. What does fixing our attention mean? Don't take your eyes off the Lord. When you're going into a trial or a tribulation, anything that's going on around you, you need to look up. That's where your help's going to come from. Don't look at mom and daddy and, and listen to all the junk that comes out of their mouth. You go to the Lord. You look at Him. What does He say? He's the final authority and the only word that is going to judge you. So you need to know what He has to say about any subject matter that you go through. Amen. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read this out of the message translation only for those of you that need it to be broken down for you. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work, your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. He called us sacrifices. Holy sacrifices. He's looking for us to put away all of that stuff and bring to Him a holy sacrifice. That's you and me in the presence of our Creator. He goes on to say, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you could do for Him. I, I really like that. Embracing what God can do for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Bring that, that sacrifice to Him. So, don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in to it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed. From the inside out, readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops a well-formed maturity in you. So where are you going to get mature? You know, He doesn't like to put many stripes on you, but He will if you are, you know, you're willful and disobedient. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 17 says this, Wherefore, gird up, that means put on your girdle, Hold firmly to the loins of your mind. Did you know that you have loins in your mind? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, Peter, I don't know what you had in your mind on that day. Anyway, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. What does he call it when you do that? He calls it ignorance. What is ignorance? It's people that are unlearned. The reason we have to build cases is so you can be learned. A learned person is not going to fail. They're not going to do something that the, gets them into trouble over and over. So, he goes on. He said, Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. What has to change? All manner of conversation. 
because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you called on the Father without respect of persons, judging according to every man's work, past the time here of sojourning in fear. How many of you fear God? That's the beginning of wisdom, you understand. So if you don't have a fear of God, you don't understand what you need to fear. If He's called you and you're not chosen, there's a fear because you were not chosen. Why would you not be chosen? We're talking about why you're disqualified. Because you gave in to unrighteousness. You allowed the world to come in and conform you to its mold. And then you started being like the world and speaking like the world and hating like the world. And because of that, you are unchosen. The calling and the election is not sure then. Understand what that means. The calling and election or choosing can be sure. But if you're not living it, and your mouth has not gotten the Holy Spirit in it to, to take away those things that the world would be saying. You don't have a chaste conversation. And because of that, you are not going to be chosen. That should make you fear. Because if you're not chosen, what does that mean? There's a lot of men that had callings on their life. They're not chosen because they did not keep with the Word of God. Yes, it's, it, it is strict. But that strictness is keeping you from a place you do not want to go. Amen? Amen. So he says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as He hath called you, is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth, judgeth according to every man's work, he's judging everything that you do, then you pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. You don't want to lose well, I don't think I can lose it. Darling, you've not even been proven yet. You don't have a clue what that means. I believe He paid the price for my sin, yes. But that has to be applied, and it's applied when you are obedient to the Spirit. Your sins are covered because you have repented. If you didn't change your mind, there's no covering for that. I can show you that in 1 Peter 2. Understand these things. 2 Peter, we'll talk about, well, Isaiah first, 20, 26 and 3. Thou wilt keep him at perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. So where does perfect peace come from? The Prince of Peace. And, and if you've got your mind on him, he'll keep you at perfect peace. But you have to keep your mind. That is the condition of perfect peace. Amen? Second Peter 1, 2 through 10 says this, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According to His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to, unto life and godliness, through life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. I think it speaks well of itself. That when you know you have a knowledge of God and of Jesus, according to His divine power, He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. He called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, give all diligence to add unto your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, that's self-control, and, temperance, and, and to temperance patience, and patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, that's love. For if these things be in you and abound, say and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligently to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Go into our closing. I hope you're still listening. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, we go back and it's what we read in the beginning. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. You cannot be at peace with all men unless you've got the Holy Spirit in you and they have the Holy Spirit in them. If they're the world, we're not to be at peace with them. We're to bring them to a place of repentance. We're to, you know, to bring them the good news of Jesus Christ. But we also have to make disciples. What is a discipleship? When a person uh, accepts that Jesus had died for their sins, then somebody has to take up the parenting role and they have to lead them through the, uh, the Scriptures, making it clear to them that those people have to change and cleanse themselves from that old way. They have to live for God and be holy and righteous people. And they cannot continue to do the things they used to do. A good spiritual father is going to make sure that you get what God says so that you can make it on that day. Amen. He does not want you to be bastards. He wants you to be sons and daughters. Amen? Amen? So, Hebrews says this, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, the Holy Ghost speaks. Did you know that? Some people don't even believe there's a Holy Ghost. I'm sorry. Uh, you need to ha have the Holy Ghost. But without Him, you're none of His. So, uh, he goes on, Today, if you will hear His voice and harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, God speaking here, proved me and saw my works for 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Say it, they have not known my ways. How would you know that you're a Christian? Because you know His ways. And you do those things that are pleasing to Him. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if... There's the if. If your doctrines don't have that if in it, your doctrine is wrong. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. God will keep you, but He requires things of you. A disciple is a disciplined one. A disciple is one that is taught in the ways of God. A disciple is one who once he becomes adjusted you know what adjustments mean, right? When, when they try to do the same thing over and over and it doesn't work for them and then they get unhappy. Look, I look at the, in the faces of people all the time. This is an unhappy world. And they're going to try to make themselves happy by psychology. Listen, I'm a psychologist. And I want to tell you, that is not the answer. There are things that you can learn from that. But you've got to know who it is that gives you joy. 
And you can only have joy when you're obeying Him from the heart. Amen. So listen. <laughs> Don't be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Are you going to be steadfast? So you've got to actually deal with your character and behavior. God is going to change your character. He's going to put away your old man and you're going to become a new man in Christ Jesus. You can't talk the same, think the same, or hang with the same. That's corruption. You have to be holy. You have to be righteous. And righteousness can be had. And He'll make you a partaker of His divine nature, but you have to do what He says. Amen? Well, I didn't think I had to do anything but saved. <laughs> oh, darling, you hadn't started salvation. You have a knowledge of it, but you have not been a partaker of it yet. That grace is going to be revealed when Jesus shows up. And He'll make the decision on that day who actually did it and who did not. Amen? So, here's the command. Be ye holy. There's no other word for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask You, Lord God, because all of us know the struggle with our sins and this nature that we have down here. We were born of Adam's race, but Lord, we are made partakers through Jesus Christ of a divine nature. I ask You, Heavenly Father, to cause our commitment to be toward personal holiness in our living and thinking and speaking. Help us to leave behind the corrupting desires of this world around us and fill our hearts with Your desires instead. Lord, we rely upon Your strength. Help us. We need You. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. I hope you listened to the end. I'm glad that you were here and didn't run out. I have had people run out. You understand? Because they can't stand the truth. But the truth will set us free. It's not doctrines of men. It's not church bodies and fellowship. It's not eating and drinking. It's this fellowship with the Holy Ghost that comes and lives in our hearts that will change us from who we are and make us who we need to be. That's the born again man. That's a son. He says, now are we sons of God. When we've done that, we can say, now are we sons of God. I want to watch you and, and I'm going to listen to your conversations. If I correct you, don't get upset. I want your mouth to be chaste. I want you to be discreet. I don't want you gossiping. I want you to set your mouth on the things above as you set your mind on things above. Amen? Get it in your heart and then let your heart be cleansed by that Word. Let it be set free from the bondage and the deception of Satan. And get yourself in line because Jesus is coming again soon. And only those have done these things. Those that have accept, accepted Jesus and have accepted His terms, that's to obey Him, and live a life of righteousness and holiness, true holiness, those people are going with Him when He shows up. Those are the sons and daughters of God. Amen? Amen. Let's be cautioned. Thank you for listening. <laughs>